<laughs> and finally, we're live, and she hasn't mocked me yet. So we're going to call this a win and move on. <laughs> it's just coming. Okay, so hey, all you crazy sci-fi and fantasy fans, it's time for your daily dose of shenanigans over here at the Blasters and Blades podcast. Just three nerdy veterans geeking out over our science fiction passions and fantastical fantasies. A place where magic is king, the sky is the limit, and space is the place, and even sometimes in alternate universes, Doc is sober. So without further ado, what? today is not I that day, that. and we're going to... Yeah, in alternate universes, there's a sober you out there somewhere. Like straight-laced and boring and like, I don't know, plays Pinochle or something. Nah. Wait, is Pinochle really a thing? Am I remembering wrong? That's really Pinochle a is a thing, but okay. even if I was boring and didn't drink, I'd still end up like Jay Boyce, because she's amazing. She, we've Very interviewed great. her, so we will move on. She is the lady of many wigs. Uh, so, <laughs> Dakota Kraut, can you uh, introduce yourself to our listening and viewing audiences? Absolutely. Hi, I'm Dakota Kraut. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> he likes long watches on the beach, uh, getting yelled at by his wife and saying yes to her as every smart man should. An Excel uh, sheet. He really loves the Excel sheets. And I understand oh, yeah. he has a long running affair, uh, but his wife tolerates it because they're progressive like that. But he has a long running affair with his Excel spreadsheet. Oh, yeah. Uh, there we go. And coffee. Uh, yeah, well, so, coffee's okay. acceptable, and that's not even an affair. That's just love. Okay. That's his life. Uh, oh, yeah. Semi seriously. Hi, I'm Dakota Kraut. Uh, I'm an author. Uh, I have. Uh, uh, six different series out, uh, 23 books on the market, a whole bunch coming out next year. Um, I am also the owner of Mountain Dale Press, um, a small independent publishing company that uh, focuses on gamelet, lit RPG, and cultivation stories. So those are the three genres that I publish in myself, which is why I focus on that with my company. Um, I don't know how much more you want of that because I could talk about awards and accolades, but they don't really matter to me. So. Well, I will say of the most important award of all is uh, North Dakota University has a whole page about you. Like, they're so proud of you. So you did good. Yeah, that University of North Dakota. Yeah. Um, so that, They probably that also hit you up in the Alumni Association for, like, do donations, too. That's how that ordinarily works. <laughs> so funny story. This is something that I, I don't often talk about is I actually uh, interned at uh, NASA JPL through the University of North Dakota. Cool. Um, yeah, so while I was in school still like at, at that i was i was working with uh, nasa jpl um on very minor projects but still it was cool um and so i got uh, to see some really cool things while i was at that school as well yep. nice yep. i just when i was googling you as the pre-show like i do stalking people you know um but uh that that article came up prominent so they really hit the SD, uh seos for that ah, to yeah. make sure that your name was linked to theirs <laughs> yeah, it's good. It's good. It's a good university. It really is. I, I don't know anything about North Dakota other than it's north. Of it's cold and windy. Uh, they have a really great aero uh, airspace engineering uh, program there. Uh, above really south. Well. Huh? It's above South Dakota. <laughs> right? No, actually, I, I, I moved. I moved out of North Dakota because last win last time I was there, like the last winter that I lived there, it got to seventy below without wind chill. And no negative. It, I saw a tree explode and I was like, I'm out. Like, because it's cold. It, yeah, because it gets so cold that the sap expands yeah, too fast. I understand that this Jeffers. is theoretically possible as a chemist, but that it actually happened yeah, without can, man forcing it freaks me out a little bit. You can, you can go and check it out on YouTube. It's a real thing. It happens all the time, which is weird. No, no, no. I like the South. I'm forged in fire. <laughs> not in the so, so, how far south did you go to warm up? Uh, Kansas City, Kansas. So it still gets cold there. That's like yeah, but it's like 600 miles south. So like, I mean, I guess it's still like it has big seasons, but it doesn't have exploding and, tree season yeah, either. But and it's there's, flat, there's hills so. and stuff. So no, no, there's like hills and stuff. So like the uh, the wind is nowhere near as bad as it, as it was in North Dakota. Um, but I mean, and the windmills, you know, they really chop up that air real well and you know slow it down some. That's nice, <laughs> and uh, you know that's where Toto's at. So and the Yellow Brook Road goes through there. I'm told. True story. I All right. People will believe that. All right, let's go. <laughs> All right. So the second part of the introduction, dear listener and viewer, uh, is how we first found them. So as uh, we hinted at earlier, this is another one of those round of episodes where Doc said, be there or else. And she scares me when she gets all mad. So we're here. So, Doc, what bar did he find you or you find him at? Because I know most of your stories start this one time at Liberty Con Bar. <laughs> it was Dragon Con, actually. Dragon Con. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. But it was the bar, right? Uh, sure. 
We'll go with that. No, it's not where we first met. We just ended up there. No, we did. We yes, we did end up there. And in fact, Dakota kept giving me massive yeah. amounts of drinks this past one, yep. and I kept going. I have to work till midnight. I can't drink all of these. <laughs> but you tried. I did. I gave it a good old army try. Never say no, I'm a too. quitter. That's right. You keep no, that up, we'll promote you again. <laughs> we had a we had a cool event and um we yeah the uh, the fantasy gather. I uh, know. So that that one was uh, yeah. That's where I think we met. But then. Oh. Uh, oh no! I I came and found you. I came and found you right away because um, I heard that the tracks were down. So many uh, panelists. Remember, I, yeah. I walked in with a horde of authors behind me, and I'm like, "Where do you need us? I'll send them this way. I'll send them this way. What do you got? What do you need? I got them all. Hey, come on!" That was this year, but we've met before this year too because we met in '19, I think. Yeah, we we did, but briefly, before, very and, super briefly, very briefly, and then we I had you on a virtual panel for Virtual Dragon Con in 2020. Mm -hmm. on lit rpg which yep. is the genre we're covering tonight too awesome um Great and genre. then but yeah this time you were like i brought you gifts of people here is oh. slave labor use it oh, as no. needed <laughs> i'm like oh thank god well i heard you were down a hundred people and like panels were about to start closing and i was like no <laughs> no not, none of my panels were about to start closing because i was like i got people on speed dial there you I go will, we will have this the show will continue even if I have to get up there and be the panelist. Nice. So, because, you know. I like it. That's that's how a majority vet track works. Mm -hmm. track hey, but lots no, of it was, booze, it was caffeine, and hate. It was very wonderful. And your, your authors did come in handy. And, um, They're great. And, and they were wonderful about going, okay, well, here's my cell phone. If you need me, let me know. So they were sure. wonderful. And I think they all had a blast with what they did. Oh, absolutely. Like, like everyone was telling me how awesome everything was. I think Jay ended up on 18 hours of, uh, of, yep. <laughs> of panels. Jay ended up on 18 hours of programming. Oh, and, uh, and she only started with like 13. Nice. And I think she started with she, eight. I thought she got 10 extra. She's. She was in double. I, I don't know. She was, I, okay. Know. So when the original schedule went out, she had like eight. By the time Dragon Con itself came around, she was already in the double digits. Nice. And then she picked up another like five hours after Dragon Con started. Nice. That's the way to go, man. Yeah. I mean, you got to get out there and, and hustle and she's doing great. So cool. So uh, let's, let's see. So that's how we met. What else you got for me? Yeah. All right, Doc. You gotta ask her the. You gotta ask okay. him the most important uh, religion questions. I've got my finger over the kick button. The religion questions, and I did pick these with a theme: Free Guy, Ready Player One, or Ender's Game. Ender's Game is a book. It's also a movie. No, I I know it is. Well, we don't no, we don't talk about that. Um, Ender's Game is a book. Eh. Uh, Free Guy is a movie. Okay. What is free guy. I've never heard of this. So good. Oh Ryan my Reynolds. god! How have I Dude. seen something and you haven't? <laughs> it's a pretty new movie, um, and it really, really, really well. It, it's it's a perfect look at our genre, like at, at my genre of game lit and lit RPG, which is it's just the coolest thing. So like we, I, I went in with another uh, author, uh, uh, James Hunter. We went and saw the movie. We walked out and we were like, "Oh my god, it's happening." <laughs> Like they're getting into our genre and this is going to be amazing and people are going to love this. And so we've been just waiting for the call, but Ryan, Ryan, you know, Ryan Reynolds is a very busy man. So it's, it's going to take a while. Yes. But it, <laughs> it was probably, I would say the best movie I've seen that pulls on geek culture without yeah. being insulting. Yep. And it was a little bit insulting still, but, but in, in, in a mostly funny way. <laughs> I mean, compared to the fact that of like some of the stuff, that I've seen nothing. Compared. Oh, all I'm talking about is how that they had the server room accessible to anyone. Oh yeah, no, that, that, that's not <laughs> how it works. That's just insulting. Like, you that, know, like, that, that's not how that works at all. He starts chopping at servers and it's like, Oh, this is the, this is the one that has everything. It's like, no, it's not. They all have, that's it. not how a server <laughs> that's okay. how servers work. I am a right. medic and my, and I had a good friend who just two weeks ago had to explain to me what a network switch was. And even I knew when I watched Free Guy before that discussion <laughs> about network switches that that's not how that works. 
It's very true. So, so that, was, that was a real insulting part. That was Hollywood <laughs> computer science. Yes. So hand wave him. I approve. Hollywood computer science. <laughs> So, what, was, what, what, so how, how did I do on that? You did fine. Perfect. JR Apparently, I failed. If you tell him you like pineapple on your pizza. That's her heresy. If you do, I know a panel for you at Dragon Con. I'll make one up for it. Uh, do like broccoli on pizza versus uh, like, you know, pineapple on pizza, right? Well, the one thing we can all unify behind is the people that put peeps on pizza. And that's just, that's like seven circle of hell level of evil. That's because it involves peeps. Yeah, I don't like those without the pizza. So adding them to pizza only makes them 10 times more horrible. I have never seen that. And I'm going to keep it that way. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, uh, somebody decided because I make a joke about the pineapple on pizza. I really don't have that strong opinion. I don't really care. Uh, but it's a fun thing just to do. Yes. Shush, Doc, you're giving away my secrets. We're playing cool. We're you playing have cool. no secrets. We're playing it cool, but uh, yeah, that they made a point of sending me all the horrific things done to pizza. Like somebody put broccoli on pizza once; they sent me that. That wasn't too terrible. I mean, it looked a little slimy, but eh, okay. I like broccoli on its own. I even <laughs> had broccoli with cheese, so you know, crust and tomato sauce maybe. But Peeps was just a bridge too far. Peeps and pickles—they're just two things that should never go on pizza. Yeah, there was a there, somebody put they put fried pickles on pizza. Don't ask me; it was horrible looking. I think it would really wreck up the crisp of the fry. But anyways. Um, so it did. Now, like I said, it looked horrible. Now for Save our us. fantasy selection. The NeverEnding Story, Alice in Wonderland, or Warcraft? I do oh. not see the theme in this one. You don't? <sighs> How do you not? So I really love Warcraft. Like, the, I love, <laughs> I love the lore of Warcraft. I love... Like the video games that have come out on it, I love like the books. The books are so dark. Oh my gosh, they're so dark. They but, are very dark, but they're so cool. Like just like how much effort and time has gone into like every nuance, nuanced detail of of the lore and that I love. So like the the big difference, yeah, Alice in Wonderland is like a, a trippy fever dream, you know, and you know there's no explanation on anything you know eat this drink this there, there's cheshire cat and all, all this other stuff going on but i don't know brother like uh, yeah gotta gotta go with the gotta go with the warhammer okay and by the way for those who are wondering what the theme is it's portal fantasy alice in wonderland the character gets sucked into another world and there's a huge game element at points and never ending story. If you keep following, not necessarily there's an interaction even in the first movie between the the character, the reader, and the characters in the book. And if you, okay, I had a huge crush on Jonathan Brandis. I'll admit it in public. He's in some of the sequels. And the dragon? It, in in never ending story, yeah, oh, the dragon, right? Yeah, you know he's he's a reader in like the I'm second kidding. one. I'm kidding. Oh, okay, <laughs> and he gets sucked into the book. Warcraft's a portal fantasy as well. These were all war portal fantasies that also had some game in them. Totally. I okay. the see, I, like it. I picked it th with the theme. JR was giving me shit in the side, side chat about there not being a theme. So I just didn't see the theme, but I could see it now. That's the because you fantasy. don't know the properties as well as I do, apparently. <laughs> well, I mean, I, I thought I saw the 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 fantasy element, same general era they were produced with Alice in Wonderland, the movie and the, and the never ending story. But I wasn't seeing how Warhammer, which is very grimdark fits into that. Warcraft. <laughs> Warcraft. Warhammer is a different IP. Oh, I was totally going Warhammer. That's yeah, that's he did too. I so I heard you said Warhammer for sure. Oh, did I say Warhammer? You definitely did. And that's why I was like, I don't think yeah, I Warhammer. Warhammer movie. <laughs> Warhammer is very grimdark. War. Craft, which is based on the World of Warcraft video game. MMO it's all also pretty dark. So I'm, I'm yeah, but the, the movie was was if you could if you went into the movie like I did, having never played the games and just enjoying it for a movie, it was great. And give me my damn sequel already. If you were an addict of the universe and Leroy Jenkins was your god, then maybe you didn't like it as much. And because those people were very vocal about not liking it. It didn't I do as well as it needed to for a sequel. I liked it, and the only version of Warcraft I haven't liked was World of Warcraft. I never got into the games, although, like I said, the Leroy Jenkins meme is hilarious. 
You just but, like Leroy Jenkins. I mean, I just like charging in ahead. I get it. Like, it's like basically a modern day equivalent of screaming bonsai as you rush forward. I was going to say, it's kind of like how you live your day. Uh, I mean, that is basically the entry way. Don't go through a, around a problem. Go through it. There right? you go. Why flank when you can charge full speed ahead? I think Notre Dame football does that as their, their strategy, too. Why pass it when we can just keep running straight ahead? JR, I don't understand muggle sports. So we're going to continue on. Muggle sports? Are you speaking like made up words again? <laughs> okay. I don't know. Dakota, you I there? Think, I think we broke him. I think Dakota froze. Or we just shocked him by, I didn't know what muggle was for a second. Uh oh. You can be so mundane. Is that a good thing? I'm not boring. Mundane. All right. We really did break him. Uh, it looks like it. Uh oh. Okay. Right, I hope he's refreshing. So, ha! So, mundane. There's a term that stems out of the SEA, and it is typically for people who do not participate in the, the game, the SEA, or the geek culture. Is that okay, I thought it was a Harry Potter thing, and I've never read the books. Or no, muggle is a Harry Potter term. No, the mundane I thought was from Harry Potter as well. No, it's not. Well, that was, it predates Harry Potter. That was concerning. It's okay. We thought we broke you, but I didn't know what uh, Muggle was, so she was just laughing at me. We might even leave that in, because why not? But, uh, all right, so we answered the religion questions. He gave <laughs> satisfactory answers. Doc is crazy. JR is right. Let's move on. JR is number never right. Doc, just um, ask number six. We're going to go with it and pretend. It's my universe, right? Don't okay. make me fire you. JR, your mother will just rehire me. Um, so... <laughs> Um. I, obviously, we love both sci-fi and fantasy. But which was your first love, Dakota? Sci-fi or fantasy? Fantasy by far. So, oh yeah. So I'm I'm fantasy all the way. Um, mm -hmm. I I like sci-fi, but just the the fantastical nature of fantasy just by itself is has always just been such a huge draw for me. You know, just um being able to have that like pure escapism knowing that, yeah, there's no way this could happen, but maybe <laughs> like, you know, like, Hey, this is a look into someone else's mind and they're not trying to make reality, but they're also not trying to like, just be wild for wild sake. Like they're trying to be an awesome storyteller. They're trying to make really cool stuff. That's always been just a huge draw for me. So that's, that's kind of where I come from uh, with, with fantasy. No, I I get it, and it's always it's interesting because lit RPG is a very much a um, a genre where the I think the two fuse a lot together. Yes, a lot. So, but we'll get more into that as we get into this series, so. into the interview. So, what um, what's your first memory of engaging in speculative fiction as a genre? Was it watching, playing a game, reading a book? Um. First ever memory was probably, have you ever read the book Martin of Redwall? I don't think I have. I'll have to look it up. <laughs> so it's, it's, a, it's about a mouse, right? So it's about a mouse who goes to find like the sword and like uh, basically the bad guy makes, right? Mm hmm And and the uh, oh, he froze again. Okay, I was gonna say I thought my tech was lagging again. Nope, this is Dakota. All right, so <laughs> let me tell you again while we wait for him to see if he refreshes real quick. While I why I will never read J.K. Rowling. I Stuff think like people need to up. read. Oh, he's he's back. He's on Wabbits. <laughs> okay. This is going to be an interesting week, isn't it, for podcasting? This is the second episode in a row where we've had the other guests have issues. Well, it's two nights in a row, even. 
I have yeah. fingerprints on my glasses, and I'm not even sure how they got there. You're poking yourself in the eye, clearly. So I'll she uh, she came, her her first books came out where I was not the target age. I was kind of busy with army life and college and stuff. And then she was. I watched her on Twitter where she was mean to some young fans, and I'm like, you know, you just don't do that. So I just never got into it. And now all this like people our age are like that seems like the only book they ever read. I'm like, dude, can you read another book? I promise you, there are more of them out there. Oh no, 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 no! I read the final battle of Harry Potter, and um, I was I was home on leave from basic training with basically pneumonia over the hot Christmas holidays, and I didn't even remember finishing it. I can't decide if that's that's because I was just so sick. We'll go with that because we don't want to insult anybody, but I just was not her target demographic. Well, I, I just, I think it was just, I felt like I remember the ending of the series because I remember call, tell, calling, I have a friend who has seen it in each movie in theaters multiple times and um, in IMAX. And, um, and I remember going and she goes, no, that's actually how the book ended. And I'm like, oh, and I guess I have read the final book. So, yeah, this is why I think Twitter is cancer and you should generally speaking avoid following people you like their stuff because then you act them, watch them on all sides, act the fool on Twitter and you're like, I kind of like your books a little bit less because now I know you're a jerk face. Well, you know, everybody's a jerk face. This is true. But I did troll J.R. Uh, George R. R. Martin once on Twitter before he blocked me. That was Well, cool. that was easy. Yeah, I don't remember what it was about. So this Did you tell I... him typing will burn calories? Because I'm pretty sure that would get you told, trolled. No, this was back. I don't even remember what we were, whatever. I think it might have even been political. He was doing one of his political rants in 2016. And I seemed, I, I think I replied something like, dude, you write incest, dragon, and rape stories. Like, who are you to get on a high horse? Just write good stories and have fun with life. There's no reason to be so unhappy. But that was the election where everybody on every side was unhappy about everything. So I and I just was having none of it. Life's so too short. Every election since I've turned like what old enough to vote? Pretty much. And I was having none of that because like I said, life's too short. So I just basically told them to chill and I got blocked. So apparently my chill wasn't chill enough. But all right, do we want to reboot? How do we want to handle this? Do you have his number or something you could reach uh, out to him? I don't have his number. I have him on Facebook. Do that. Um, why don't we pause the video? I can't. If I stop recording, then uh, I got to get a new link. What we could do is just start over if he's got better Wi-Fi, if there's anything we could do, and then okay. um, add this as bonus content at the end, editing out. Because <laughs> there was some good stuff here. No, there was some um, great stuff here. Dakota's so much can... fun. I do enjoy Dakota a lot. He's a great guy. Yeah, but you can't marry his wife or him, even though they like chemistry. But uh, you know what? I'm just saying the periodic. They have a little one that is still in diapers, and hell the fuck no, I'm never doing potty training again. All I'm saying is. Like, I did look. potty training twice in my life. I did it once for me and once for my son. I'm never doing it again. All, right, all I'm saying is chemistry isn't real. It's a made up conspiracy by the government to trick us into taking drugs. What? I don't know. I'm just trying to see if I could poke you and get you going. You're so <laughs> weird. Duh. It's part of my charm. Oh. I had someone convinced at a family reunion once that I didn't think birds were real. All right. Uh, hi. hi, guys. I think I blew a fuse or something. Okay. Yeah. So. Um, <laughs> I'm sorry. That should not have been as funny as it was. But uh, it was it's all good. Right. Also, my internet or uh, my camera is trying to restart right now. All I right, a, so I have a virtual camera. I don't actually have a camera. Just what digitizes my image and throws it up there. What? What? I don't know. I don't do that. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, no. I got asked actually if I'd be willing to reclass to Camo. Uh, I wouldn't. <laughs> I was in the army and I just kind of looked at the guy and I'm like, but he's like, but you know stuff. You know stuff that the S6 shop doesn't know. And I went, they know it. They're just playing dumb. Yeah. 
All right. And so goes, no, they're not. And I looked at him and I went, I'm telling myself they're playing dumb. If they're not, then you should really, really go down and talk to their NCAA. <laughs> All right. Let's see here. Oh, look, an image. That's not me. Yay. No. All right. So we can, we have some options. We can start back from the beginning or we can edit um, right about the time you went at about 19 minutes ish. We've just been bantering while we waited. Um, and then <laughs> she was asking you about your first memory. If you could just restate that question, Doc. Yeah. Uh, and then I'll just cut and edit it appropriately. On the bright side, we're not a super formal podcast, so it's not like this is going to be <laughs> Cool. Sure, I mean, go for it, however you prefer. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Oh, two, two, three, two, one. So what would be your first memory of fiction as a genre? Reading it, right? Not well, obviously, probably not writing it, but reading it, gaming, watching TV or movies in it. Uh, uh, so, yeah. Doc, Dakota, let me answer this for you real quick because we were talking offline you, before you got here, Doc. And what he actually told me is he's such an amazing writer that his mom actually was injured uh, when she he stole a pen through her belly and he wrote his first uh, novel in utero. It's a true story. Um, so the as, book we're talking as about a today, woman who has been pregnant, I don't find this nearly as funny as the males I'm, in the room do. Well, so in reality, he's wrong. She was not injured. She just got kind of a massage as I tickled the keyboard. Yes! <laughs> nice comeback. Hey, I get an extra drink every time somebody tells JR he's wrong. <laughs> nice. Oh, Doc. That's why you had Jenny Blackstone on, isn't it? Just so she could do that. I think you set that up on purpose. Um, All right. You're not wrong. <laughs> All right. So let's move right <laughs> along. What was your? Uh, what is it about speculative fiction as a genre that you love so much? Um, you know, honestly, it's it. It's the fact that everything can be reality like so you know like who doesn't want all right so with speculative fiction kind of in the genres that i write it's always kind of progression fantasy right um the idea behind it is that everyone can start from the same point it, if everyone started from the same point i the character because i'm you know everyone just kind of whoever the main character is they try to see themselves as that person um I, the main character, would make the same smart decisions that this character is making, and I would go and I would succeed above everyone else, right? And and that's kind of the thing. Like even with the lowest and the worst starting points, you can go and and reach the highest heights, better, faster, Wait, stronger, right? Is it progression fantasy just character development? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. No. So that's a whole different thing. So. Um, <laughs> Oh yeah. So progression fantasy in 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 terms of especially in terms of lit RPG cultivation and and uh, game lit, um, there's actual direct correlation from how you progress to how strong you are, right? Yes. Right. And I think in game lit, the difference between character development and progression is much clearer. I think so. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a. I mean, with uh, like lit RPG and such, it's a. Uh, hard magic system so you can you the reader can see directly what the changes are how they happen why they happen and like down to the 100th decimal in some cases you know not not the 100 but down to the 100s position right <laughs> um and you know for myself I, I usually try to keep the math and stuff pretty light but still show that it matters because it does throughout my whole my whole system um i have you know i have my dice that i use every day i have uh various like sequences and, and cards that i use to uh determine scenes and like what things happen stuff like that like it's all laid out and arrayed in front of me um and but all of it is explained to the reader so you know why those choices are made right so it's it's a really fun way of doing things and it um really follows along with like Sander, uh, Brandon Sanderson's. He has these really great things that are like, he tried to codify the laws of magic, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it, it falls right in, right in there. Like, uh, you know, the uh, ability of the author to use the magic system in a way that affects the story positively is directly related to the reader's understanding of that, right? Yeah. Um, and so I really took that to heart and that's, that's kind of how the genre is. So it's really good stuff. 
I I do enjoy the genre uh, a lot more than when I first discovered the genre. Sure. Which was in an email, and I went, "Is this really a thing?" Because we found editors, or <laughs> no, no, no. It was because I got an email, and it was like, "I do this," and I'm like, "Monkey, say what?" Or and, uh, I was just looking at this email, and I called my friend, and I went, "Is this a thing?" Mm -hmm. And it will be. It will be mainstream. I believe it. Uh, uh, no, I think, and I think having Free Guy really helped make it more mainstream. Absolutely. But this was also like several years, and um my idea uh, and uh i was not really in tune with the subgenre concept sure. at the time either so i was like uh <laughs> okay so well i'm glad you got better at that saska <laughs> well you know i will take direction and feedback and i will uh Wait, go what? and learn say that one more I time i don't know that that i believe that oh i'll take direction and feedback but not from you jr See, I keep wanting to call him Junior. That's not how this relationship works. <laughs> That's not what JR stands for. But I mean, we can know, go with that if it makes you feel I just better. see Junior Hanley. I'm like, all right. <laughs> yes! All right, you're all fired. All right. He's coming back again. I tell you, man. <laughs> all right. All right. You're all fired. Doc, ask the next question before I boot you all off my show. You will boot us. It's not your show. Oh, so. <laughs> Um, what is it that you love about the speculative fiction genre? He, he answered that one. Just did that he already one. answered that one. I love everything about it. <laughs> so, um, how did your love of it, though, transition you into writing stories in it? Particularly lit RPG. So, uh, I have a, a background in, so I have a degree in, in computer science. I, I did um, uh, really intensive uh, IT work with the military for eight years. Uh, so the army specifically, um, and, you know, so I just, I have a, a background with a certain way of thinking, right. And combining that with fantasy, which was, you know, my first true love of, uh, in reading, you know, is, is fantasy combining that with kind of more logical thinking was a really natural step for me. Right. And, and so uh, making it, you know, I, I put out uh, my first book in uh, 2016, which is only five years after, um, you know, becoming a self-published author was really a feasible concept. Thanks to Amazon. Like that started in 2011, right. It's been, it's been 10 years since that has existed. Right. And I was there in the first five years of it and, and it's just going up from here. Right. It's an entirely new, thing and even 10 years in it's still a, like no one knows what's going on um and so just trying to hold on and and run with it is is something that's super cool and super fun yeah all right so many authors let their own real life experiences influence the way they tell stories so were there any moments that you think shaped you in the way you um tell a tale oh yeah um so there's one really defining moment and it's really out of character for me <laughs> so uh so um so one of the when, when i was first writing uh i was in i was in college at the same time you know going to uh, university of north dakota and uh i had written the vast majority of my first book and i got to a point where i'm like hey i'm, I'm about ready to publish this i'm but is it good enough right is it good enough to publish it even if it's just self-published and so I did, I made like a terrible, terrible mistake. And, and I, I took a creative writing course. Um, <laughs> I know, I know. See, it's things that pe like this that people don't tell you ahead of time. Um, <clears throat> so I, I took that, took that course. And this was, I only know of two authors who studied creative writing academically, who were actually good to read that I know of. It's, <laughs> it's rare than unicorn truffles. So um, yes. I don't know. I don't know where that came from, but there it is. Um, <laughs> uh, no, so I, I took that course and me and the uh, myself and the professor did not see eye to eye. And uh, this was me fresh out of, you know, being pretty much active in, in the army at that time. And um, so, you know, I, I came in at 21 uh, to, to the university and I was doing this and I think I, you know, anyway, so uh, the defining moment was 
<laughs> she slapped a paper down on, on the table and she's just furious with me. And she says, no one will ever read anything you write. Yeah. And oh, so, wow. And wow, so I went, wrong. Yeah. And I was like, OK, well, if it's never going to be good enough, it's good enough now. So I went home and I slapped the publish button and here we are, you know. Um, Did you that, ever uh, give her a copy of your book with how many nope, sold? I forgot I, her name. I totally would. Nope, I forgot her name. I, I'm a spiteful asshole. Well, see, Me that's too. How... I'd be like inviting her to my first launch party when no. I make uh, you know all the big things. <laughs> this is this is how I do spite. This is how I do spite. Um, if someone falls below neutral, I forget they exist. Right? I like so, that one. Yep. You're dead to me. Very Sicilian. Yeah. It, you know, it's like, it. I, I don't even remember her name. Seriously. Um, Like just completely. Forget. All I remember is that moment. Couldn't tell you what she looks like. Couldn't tell you her name. Not going to bother because literally just doesn't matter to me. Um, The only thing that matters is the thing that pushed me into realizing that perfection is the enemy of good. And we can always strive for getting better, but striving for perfect is a career killer. Right. And yeah. Yep. Yes, and so is. that's something analysis I, paralysis yeah. is what they call it in the army. Oh yeah. Yep. We we call it um uh editing death spiral. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you could edit the soul out of a book. Exactly. So. I have no soul, so I'm always gonna be good then. Because you're Perfect. a soulless ginger. But I mean it just comes with the territory. Oh, but Lucifer loves you anyway. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just going with it. I'm colorblind. We'll we'll pretend. All right, so <laughs> I don't hey, know. there's a reason everything in my company is black and white, man. I dye my hair purple and he calls me a ginger. Wait, are you really purple? colorblind too, Dakota? Uh, I will not say that I am because my wife is probably listening or it will be at some point. She does not believe me, but I I have so much trouble with color. Like, it's unreal. How did and, you do on the dot test when you, uh, when you enlisted? I knew what it was going to say. Oh, you prepped in advance. I should have <laughs> done that, but I didn't know. So I failed it. But. So it's it's like it kind of like fades in and out for me. So like I can kind of get most stuff, but I'm never confident when someone's like, oh, it's this color. I'm like, oh. See, I had a yeah. male friend who told me that's just I have straight male eyes was his excuse when that happened. So for me, it's I, I don't have the ability to distinguish various shades. So if you look at a Crayola crown box, the basic eight colors. I'm good to go, but don't put dark blue, purple, and black together because it all looks like the same. But if you put white between them, I can mostly tell. But any yeah. shades, like yeah, I'm done. Same, same deal, man. Oh, like so yeah, it, it's it technically your colorblind. It's a, form of, it's a form of red green colorblind. Nice, good. Now so go and laugh violently. But uh, <laughs> they, <laughs> they, uh, <laughs> the guy that did the uh, enlistment physical at the Richmond Maps knew my grandpa. So suddenly the weight was where it was supposed to be, even though it wasn't. And the uh, colorblindness test, suddenly I could see color and I had all the MOSs open to me. So wow. when I was finally uh, out processing the first time after my first deployment, they're like, huh, you're colorblindness. And I'm like, did I just get a disability? Send me to the VA. And they're like, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> <laughs> I tried. But uh, speaking of, of military service, so your bio, and you've talked about a little bit, you were in the US Army. So we ask all of our authors who are also military veterans this question, but how do you feel like your time in uniform affects the stories you tell? Oh man. So it does, you know, like even if it's just in the writing of it, you know, like I sit down and I, I work until the job is done. You know what I mean? Like, and, and I had to set limits on, on what I can write a day or else I'll sit there and sit there and just keep working until it's done so I can go do other things. Right. <laughs> so like, oh man, like I, I have, I get, I go to 5,000 words a day when I'm writing. Right. And then I, I'm like, okay, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit more. And then all of a sudden it's like 6,000, 8,000 words in and I'm like, no, I need to stop. Um, so one of them is just the sheer machine that, kind of become when I'm writing, I'm like, gotta, gotta get words down on paper. Um, in terms of actual storytelling, uh, it definitely, definitely colors my opinion a little bit. Um, when my character has to wait, he's like, no, I, ah, no, ah, not again. Um, hurry up and wait. Yes. Allergy <laughs> of anybody who's in the service. Yep. It's, it's a giant weakness, but it's also like, 
so it's so like routine but it's so infuriating at the same time that's right? why i can't go to comic-con i never go to a panel because i just look at all the lines and go oh, no no man but the ability to be know. bored is a skill that you learn in the military oh, that is man. overrated and or underrated i should say in yes. this crazy age where everybody's like so tech and instantaneous <laughs> gratification mm -hmm. i'm like i can sit there like i'll entertain myself and tell a story in yeah. my head because if you say you're bored you go. and you've got nothing to do and you can't look like you're doing something important, they will mm -hmm. find you crap details to do. Absolutely. And so just kind of the the idea that, you know, you can take that time in your own head to do stuff because your mind is free while your hands are busy, you know, um, yeah. and just pushing that to the extreme is brings us to where we are now, you know, 23 books on the market in five years. I have something like anywhere from 12 to 18 coming out next year. So it's just because I've been sitting on a backlog for about two years now. <laughs> Good problem to have. Yep. I'm, I'm planning to, to drown the world in ink and then see what happens. It should be fun. Uh, I wish I had that problem. I'm a slower writer, but uh, I will try not to hate you and, and not to turn green with, with envy. Hey man. So all you, all you got to do is sit down at your computer for 10 hours a day and write. What's the hard, what, what's the hard it, part? It would take me like twice as long. Hours. Well, no, it's just uh, when, when you have brain damage, you work twice as hard to get half as much. But the alternative is early onset dementia. So you just push. Well, there you go. <laughs> no, see, that's what I'm saying, though, is like, yeah, I mean, so th the thing is that like people oftentimes will be like, hey, man, like, how, what are you doing different? I'm like, literally nothing. You know, like the, the me who started this five years ago and the me who does this now, we work the same hours. You know, we um like yeah i was a uh, super broke th working three jobs military career just married student who was also writing at the time and me now work the same amount of hours you know like i'm, I'm in a different location i'm focused on one job but it's like uh, i i get asked a lot like how has life changed and what's changed is the location you know what's changed is ease of access but the actual time of writing the actual time of like what i do in a day has not really changed you know i go to the gym i eat breakfast i write until it's time for my kid to go to bed and, and then i go back to work after i put her to bed <laughs> you know and it's you know people are like oh well how do you keep this up well i just don't stop that that's that's really what i was getting at there i wasn't uh no, no i'm just messing it's cool I, I'm, so when they tell you okay, you're never walk again and you can like every day <laughs> after that's a blessing so absolutely man everything else is just gravy so uh speaking of gravy uh and hey. your time in the uniform oh. did you ever draw on people you knew when you were in uh for characters you write <sighs> only well i i would i told a few people that i was writing and they were like oh that's cool yeah. And I mean, that's fairly standard when you're first starting to write because, you know, there's there's a reason that there is a idea of the starving artist, you know, like the average author makes negative money per year. Right. On, on, on writing. Um, so there are a few people like the medics, especially. Right. So, um, you know, the any anytime you see rub some dirt in it, that comes straight from the medic. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> <laughs> super glue works wonders too just i like, actually use super glue a lot like when i had like blisters and stuff and i probably shouldn't have my feet are pretty nasty <laughs> yeah I, I had a uh i ended up running into the medic that set my so i dislocated my shoulder in a firefight i got slammed into the butterfly handles on a 50 cal in the turret Jeez. and i went to the uh i went to the medic afterwards and i remember the guy was a short little mexican guy he's the funniest guy you'd ever meet uh, and he was like, basically told me to get the sand out of my lady parts. And he used some more colorful language that I don't want this to get, uh, yep. not safe for work tag. And then, uh, I ran into him again at the VA in Hampton and he just looked behind me. He goes, you do it yet? I like turned around and it was him. I'm like, do what? Cause I wasn't sure he remembered me. He's like, well, you finally get the sand out of your, I'm like, oh. so he did care. But yeah, so I, I, I've actually written his character into some of my books too. So I get it, yep. right? <laughs> Most of the time you do that though with the military, like if they knew, they would think it was hilarious. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Unless and, they're that, uh, that one bad officer like in uh, Band of Brothers that everyone hated. Like with the exception of that one guy who probably wouldn't like it, most of the people in the military would be like, oh, that's awesome. Exactly. Absolutely, dude. I, I've yeah. ran into the problem at 
my my job where I, I was a medic and they sent me to the CPR and stop the bleed course, which actually cites medic training in the contents of the course. And I was saying something and somebody looked at me absolutely freaked out and they went, I'm like, I'm lazy. And they went, so we don't, but I thought, and I went, no, 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 I am lazy. I want you to be safe and do the right thing. So I don't have to actually be a medic because <laughs> I will be a medic and I guarantee <laughs> fucking to you, you will survive. I will also guarantee fucking to you that I will do everything in my power to survive. And you may not necessarily like it because I do not care if I'm hurting you. That sounds like, or so we didn't actually have a paramedic or a medic. Luckily we there was a a paramedic who is treating the class and he goes and welcome to what an army medic looks like <laughs> yeah i was gonna say our, we had a guy that was a paramedic in boston in our unit so we just sort of unofficially acquired a medic bag and we let him do it because they didn't assign us one but he was also a jerk so my medic bag is in the basement i still have my medic bag that i, I think there's have. something about short people from boston that just makes them mean <laughs> Did you run into that when you were in the sort of little Boston guys? I'm telling you, they're the meanest you'll ever get. But it's wicked <laughs> awesome. No, I never ran into short little me Boston <laughs> guys. I ran into tall, heavy said depend to Boston women. So we had, uh, I dislocated my shoulder twice. Once I went to the medic and after that, and he was such a jerk. I'm like, I'm just going to let Whitey do it. And he's like, oh yeah, this totally works. Just slam your shoulder into the, cause we had steel doors on the Humvees cause it's up armor. Slam your shoulder. It'll set it right back. We'll be good to go. And I did it and it didn't work and it still hurt. And he goes, no, you got to do it just the right angle. And he, he showed me hitting his own undamaged shoulder and I did it again. And the third time I was about to, and he goes, you are a freaking idiot, aren't you, Sergeant? And I'm like, you son of a, so then he said it for me. But so I've got a little bit of a grudge. <laughs> no, what? I'm still bitter. <laughs> <laughs> I would be too. Pain so makes you not think so clearly. All right. But uh, speaking of pain, uh, we, we talked a little bit about how your service, how it relates to the stories you tell. But let's look at it, how it affects the stories as you engage them as a reader or, or consumer. Do you think after having been in the army that it changes the way you view content? Be oh, yeah. Movie, game, whatever. Absolutely. I look at things and I'm like, huh, there are people like this in real life. Interesting. <laughs> oh, people would write that in a story where it's there forever. Hmm. Interesting. You know, just, it, you know, kind of going from, you know, uh, military to civilian life. You look at things differently. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And the things that a lot of people get annoyed about that people get uptight about. It's like, Hey, I'm not getting shot at man. Like, yeah, this is glorious. Like I'm super happy with not getting shot at. So you just have your little temper tantrum over there and I'll be happy over here, you know? And so really that's colored a lot of how I just do life, not just content, but yes, also content makes me end reading or watching a show sometimes because I'm just like, Nope, too many dumb decisions. I'm out. Yep. <laughs> so do you ever watch like fantasy or sci-fi and their military system? Like, yeah, that's not how any of that would work. And I'm done. That <sighs> They're either way too competent and it's like, okay. Or uh, they're so incompetent that it's space balls, you know? Yeah. It's like, too dumb to very, live. Yeah, like there's, there's very little like showing the military as it is, which is pretty competent can work with really outdated gear and make cool things happen. And then like go out there and get stuff done. They're like, there's very little of that. It's always like, Oh, we're the most high tech. Yeah. Everything's awesome. And they're like, Oh no, we have no access to our technology. Oh no, we can't do anything. Oh, we're useless. And it's like, no, 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 no. That's the air force, not the army. Well, yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> um, so I noticed... As Casey takes sight on me. <laughs> yeah, no well, now know if she listens to more than just her interview in the podcast. Yeah. So that's one of the things that always got me is like, they always for the characters, it's either everyone was, like lowbrow criminal barely could you know walk without dragging their knuckles or they're all like super superman type and i'm like mm -hmm. you know you've got such a diverse mix of people that enlist and they all enlist or take commissions for various reasons and it's like you don't see any of that for people that didn't serve like sometimes the right. people in the military they're they're the criminal element that you probably wouldn't want to date your daughter but you'd certainly want them to protect her should the bad guys come knocking at the door 
you know, when they started, you know, the kinder, gentler army and forcing out all the people that were the bar fighters and the heavy drinkers in the 12th marriage and 15th DUI, like, yeah, that, that's, you know, the kind of people you probably don't want in a peacetime army, but I'd take any one of them in a firefight over Joe Blow in the back who can get a perfect PT score, but pisses his pants when someone frowns at him, you know? <laughs> I absolutely you, know. And you don't see any of that. Like, I actually deployed with a guy who's a, is an E7 when, when we deployed. He was probably one of the last people from West Virginia that got the go-to-war or go-to-jail speech from a judge. So, uh, you know, and you never see any of that diversity of, of experiences. And Doc's trying not to choke laughing. So uh, if you pay extra, I promise you she'll let you read the side chat where she's mocking me and everybody else. <laughs> I but, don't know. Do, do we do we have that feature? It, you know what? Could, if they actually. throw enough money at us, I'll find the feature. Oh no! <laughs> uh -oh. Well, you, we've got friends. I understand. You know the guy that does the tech for Dragon Con, and I think if he's got like a hundred people that come every year, he probably learned a thing or two. Yeah, he also. Yeah, no, we'll leave that alone. What was well, 102 this year? Did you did you increase your size on the convention? JR, your ability to understand scientific notation and read scientific notation is very bad. <laughs> Look, all I know is if I invert the polarity and turn around the dilithium crystal, everything works. No. No. That hurt, that hurt a little bit inside. <laughs> why why would you invert it? No, you just never mind. Forget it. Forget it. Just, if just it's good stop. enough for Jordan the Forge, it's good enough for me. <laughs> All right, Doc, We're ask him the fandom questions. Hand. Ask him the fandom questions. I will. So transitioning away from JR's retardedness of science and going into everything fandom, have you had any cool fan art or somebody cosplay one of your characters yet? Yes, both of those actually. So Awesome. Yeah, uh, I have, well... I get really cool fan art. So I, I really, okay. So I really love sending boxes of books to schools, right? Um, so like uh, English teachers, whatever it is, librarians, whoever, whoever does their, their reading programs and such. And every once in a while I'll get um, like, uh, like a little stack of um, like art or um, really cool, like uh, book reports. Right? So they'll do like a book. Now, report now what age schools do you send them to? I, I so depends on the series. So this this particular one was Divine Dungeon, and that was sent to like, um, it was sent to a high school, but it got grabbed by like the I think eighth grade teacher it was, and she's just I like, know. yeah, and and uh, so I got a bunch of art back and a bunch of like cool stuff like that, and, but you know I can't post them anywhere because like I don't have their permission or their parents. I, I can't permission. wait for my son to be old enough that his school actually wants to book them <laughs> I could give them right because he's in elementary school and they're right. like. Uh, this is like a junior high book. And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> um, other than that, I have one character in the Completionist Chronicles. So uh, a follow-up to Ritualist, like we were talking about, uh, that's super easy to cosplay. His name is Jackson, right? <laughs> and uh, Jackson has this uh, uh, spell that allows him to turn his head hands into T-Rex heads, right? And so um, I've had people show up, even at Dragon Con already, just... You know, you just have the dinosaur heads and they walk in, they're like, guess who I am? I'm like, ah, you're Jackson. Yeah. That's so, awesome. Yeah, super easy cosplay, you know? <laughs> but that's fun. It's easy so fun. cosplays really are still fun. Absolutely. Yeah. And then I have a bunch of people who said they're going to be posting uh, pictures on my Facebook because uh, they're going trick or treating as my characters. So nice. Yeah. So that'll be pretty neat. Nice. Oh. I, I will admit, I had somebody ask me recently if I was going to go trick or treating with my son in a cosplay and in a costume, and I went, "Yes, <laughs> absolutely." There you go. And they went, "Of what?" And I and I named some character from a series, and they went, "Doesn't that character just wear normal clothes?" And I went, "Yes." There you go. <laughs> <laughs> like I got him a Halloween costume. <laughs> And I remember to buy the Halloween candy. What more do you uh, want? I go with the Wendy Adams approach. I just tell everyone I'm a serial killer because they look like just like everybody else. I thought that's because you might be. You know, you do live in the basement and you don't have a face. This is true. And so, I do collect spare body parts. Wait, what? Did I say that quiet part out loud? <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> People wonder what we are up to and 
now we know why I won't give them normal answers. Um, so has anyone asked for your autograph away from a convention or even at a convention or a book signing? Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, I've signed all, all sorts of things. Um, like I had one dude who, um, did his, uh, like his Kindle, it was like a really high end Kindle. I forget exactly the name of it, but it was like a brand new model Kindle. And he handed me a permanent marker and had me sign the back of it. And I was like, Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. I know somebody who's done that with theirs and they've kept each mm -hmm. and every model. Mm -hmm. That's pretty, I mean, it's cool, but it's also like, this is a very expensive thing for me to be signing. Okay. Um, <laughs> no. uh, yeah. One, a really cool one. I was on my way to Canada and um just because i was going to write with another author and um on the flight the guy sitting next to me kept looking at me weird i'm like hey how's it going he's like i see i see your uh your your mountain dale thing are you dakota kraut and i was like oh my god i've made it i have arrived <laughs> like <laughs> the, the canadians awesome. know who i am you know Actually, uh, he was just a process server, and they were um, suing you. But you know, yeah, right. No, so, uh, <laughs> that would be my luck. Cool. That's why I'm joking. Nice. Well, he uh, he snapped photos with me and sent like as soon as we were landing, he was sending stuff to his family, and that was really neat. So that was pretty cool. Um, but that I love being approached in public, so please do that. <laughs> <laughs> yes, don't follow him around. Just approach him. Yeah, just approach him. Just walk right up to me and say hi. Like you know, don't, so, don't follow. Just what would you say is your funniest slash weirdest fan interaction? Funniest. Oh man. <clears throat> I gotta keep it somewhat family friendly. Um I had Goodbye. I had a fan who asked me if I followed the practices that I detail in one of my books about cultivation. It's all about like body purification. Uh oh, he froze again. You froze again. Is that your? Yeah. Oh no! So it's like okay. So I had a fan who asked if I did, um, if I if I practice what I wrote about, right? So this in my fantasy novel, and he was uh, asking. He's like, "Hey, do you um, do you actually do this? And if so, can I harvest your organs? Because doing that makes it really like it makes for really good organs that sell for a really good price." And I was like, what in the actual F? Like, <laughs> are you are you being serious? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, no. And he goes, well, I, mean, I wouldn't, you wouldn't die from it. And I was like, dude, are you, I wouldn't even be dead in this hypothetical. Like, holy cow. Like, <laughs> like, like hot dang, man. So that was definitely one of the weirdest ones. Um, yeah. Uh, that was... Can we do a hashtag organ harvesting on this? So I was like, oh my goodness. And so uh, then I'm like, no, I eat like cheeseburgers. They're really yummy. <laughs> 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 you know, stuff like that. Um, and then, I don't know, I've had a lot of funny ones. I've had a, really, a lot. The cool thing, though, is I've had a lot of really heartfelt ones, right? Like where I've been able to help someone out of a tight spot or like uh, this one time at, at Dragon Con. I actually like this, this guy came up to me and he, uh, it was really cool. Cause I saw him again this year at Dragon County found me again, but last time he got there and he had stood in line for hours to get into America's Mart and came and found my booth. And he had promised his kid that he would get him the new book that I had just released. And I brought some with me and he got in and we had just sold out. <laughs> right. And dude was so sad. And he's like, I work, he's like, I tried so hard for my kid and he just loves your stuff. I, I just, I don't know how I could have done this. And so like, I'm like, Hey man, like get your kid on the phone. Let's do this. So he called, he called his, his uh, son and, and we like, I, I chatted with him. And I was like, Hey man, just so you know, your dad is amazing. He's awesome. He worked so hard to get in here, but like, it was not at all his fault. I'm going to get his, I'm going to get his address. I'm going to send you every book I've written. Right. Oh yeah, exactly. And then, so me and his dad had a big hug and, and like manly fist bump after that. And then, um, <laughs> and then now like, I, I hope to see him every single year and, and his kid at, at Dragon Con. Right. And then 
because every time I see him, I'm like, dude. And so, yeah, it, it's pretty cool stuff. Like when you can do stuff like that, it's just so super, super neat. Yeah. No, yeah. no. And kids are anything that encourage readers. Mm -hmm. My my kid just ended up with his uh, took his grounded. And my, my mom was like, why did you let him pick his his mandatory reading book? And I'm like, because I still want him to like reading, even if he's grounded. Fair. All right. So uh -oh. next. We froze Dakota oh, he's again. He's still Is there. He? Did he blink? Blink once for a sign of life. All right. So duh, this is where we talk about everything Dakota has written. So no, he really did freeze. Oh, my goodness. This is going to be a bear to edit. <laughs> We're gonna have to hire this one out. Uh, I don't have the time this for this. This one will be easier to edit than the other one. Is he back for real this time? All right, we the thought real we Dakota. Were just, I hope please so. step forward with the tickets right, so grounded. Is, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So this no, is my son. In, I was saying my son ended up with his took us grounded, and but uh, I had to take him to get a new reading book, and I still let him pick it out because I still want him to love reading. Yes. I no agree. gaming, I but reading. Uh, again, he froze. All right. So, Dakota, can you tell us everything you've written, like the Reader's Digest version of your body of work? Hmm. All right. I'm here. <laughs> can you not hear me? Uh, no, you froze again. Maybe Kansas City has worse Wi-Fi than the rural sticks of North Carolina. I mean, Kansas, hello? No, I don't know what's going on. Toto. I don't know. I know they, like, flatten witches with uh -huh. houses there. All right. Let's get, try this again. Give us a five. No, he paused again. Uh, you paused again. Do we need to do this some <laughs> Do we need to do this some other time, Dakota? I mean, is there any way we can get you a better no, Wi-Fi yeah. or... No. I don't know what's going on, man. Like it's it's a very strange thing. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, uh, I have I have I just, I have Google Fiber too, right? I should have no connectivity issues ever, right? So I don't know what's going on. All right, we're maybe gonna... it's because of the 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 virtual background. Mm. Don't I don't think, think so. we've ever had a guest use one, so I couldn't say. All right, so we're going to count to five quietly, and then we're going to ask the question again, and then we'll let the editing people. All right, so Coda, can you give us the Reader's Digest version of everything you've written? You said you've had, what, six series going? <clears throat> yeah, um, so Reader's Digest version. Um, that's a good question. So uh, the, first, the first book I ever wrote was... Um, uh, Divine Dungeon. And so that series is focused on a um, place, so a dungeon, like in video games, trying to lure in adventurers with promises of loot and power and cool items and like rapid growth and all this other stuff, all the while it's trying to eat them, right? Um, and so that's the Divine Dungeon, right? It's a book. Did I freeze? Nope. It's Dakota again. I don't know. I don't know what you want to do, Doc. I mean, the conversation is interesting. I don't know. I try. <laughs> <laughs> I try to have right. a conversation interesting. You, you froze right when you said, okay, Divine Dungeon. Oh, seriously? Yeah. Oh, man. I talked for so, so you, long. If you're gonna, I was like... I would, is Do he a, still there? Because normally my internet's the one that's fritzy. Yeah, so if you I, take I don't a, know what's going on with this. I literally upgraded three days ago. So, Do you want to reschedule so you can figure it out? I mean, I'm no, no. game to do whatever you are. Hey, man, if I'm sorry about the editing job, but let's power through because I, I have very little time until like February after this. Yeah. 
So, okay. um, so what you do is you, uh, I'm going to just go ahead and pay Andrea Pearson. She's the one that's on the six figure authors. Her okay. husband does audio editing. He's an audio engineer. So I'm just going to suck it up and pay his exorbitant rates just to get this clean. <laughs> Uh, oh, no. Autumn, Autumn is uh, has limited skill set. She's nice and willing, but so I'm just going to send him two episodes. So. She's actually she does mostly she's doing audio narration. So if you if you need a new audio narrator, she's a good person. Gotcha. But so do a five count in your head. We're not going to talk, and then jump right into answering the question of your body of work. So um, the I have the Divine Dungeon, which is my first series that I've ever written. It is a story about a dungeon, right? So like from video games and stuff that creates uh, monsters and loot and treasure. And it uses all of that to lure adventurers in with the promise that they can have rapid growth and really cool items and stuff really quickly. Um, and so that's a five book completed series. Uh, then there's the Completions Chronicles, which is planned to have 20 books. Um, I know I do long series usually. Um, and it is the story. Uh, so it's, it's a guy who go, goes into a video game permanently. And so he takes a super slow growth build so that he can have just like a phenomenal foundation of power as he moves up through the different books. Um, and so by, by the end of the 20th book, we should be seeing some really cool stuff with him. Um, my third series, that's just like, th these are all solo series right now. Third series is uh, full murder hobo. And that one's really fun, uh, really fun to write. It's super fun to read, and it's, it does super duper well. People love it, which is super cool. The name um, is awesome. Thank you. Yeah, and the, the name of the book is Something. That's the first book. Uh, the second book is just about to come out. It's titled Anything. Um, and the third book, when that comes out, will be titled Everything. So I'm going to have Something, Anything, and Everything, right? So if you need something to read, I've got you. If Hey, anything you need to read, this guy right here. Hey, make sure to read Everything by Dakota Kraut. Right. That's, that's my marketing campaign. It's just good stuff. <laughs> um, I have a couple of co-authored series as well. So um, these are spinoffs of my own main series. So there's the Artorian's Archives, which is uh, the 10th book is just about to come out. Um, there is and it's super cool. It's, it's like a super old man who starts cultivating and getting strong. So like completely the reverse of like, you know, young man starts out. He goes about his day, you know, like, and just picks up a sword and he's awesome. This guy's like, I'm old and I'm ready to die, but oh, well, I guess I gotta, gotta go and fight again here. It's super fun. It's really, really funny. Um, and then the Wolfman Warlock uh, is a co-written between myself and James Hunter, spinoff of the Completionist Chronicles. Um, also super fun. Second book comes out tomorrow, so uh, October 27th. So it's called Librio Hexer. It's really fun. Um, it has a giant chicken on the front cover, so it's hard to miss. And, <laughs> and then the final series is Lion's Lineage with uh, myself and Rohan Hubukar. And it's a super great start to a series. It's going to probably be a trilogy um, about the creation of a kingdom when even like random people have like demigod-like powers. So it's, it's really fun. All right. Yeah. Well, those all sound fascinating, but today we are going to talk about your Completionist Chronicles, more specifically book one, The Ritualist. So where did you get the premise for this uniform, uh, uniform universe? Was it psychedelics, Ouija board, or overindulging expired MREs? Probably that last one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not going to lie, man. When you eat a meal and has 3,000 calories by itself, and they give you three of those for one day, you know, it's... Yeah. <laughs> um, so th this one was, you know, just... Um, uh, it was a study of the genre, really. So when I was first writing this series, I took the time to read everything that was out in the genre at the time. And I could do it at that point. And currently, I can't. There's way too much, way too much. Um, so I read everything in the genre. And I'm like, hey, man, what works for me? What doesn't work for me? What really worked for the audience? What didn't? And then I took all that, plus my you know current knowledge as a d and you know, um, game master, uh, dungeon master, and uh, turn that into, you know, a, a really cool book about, you know, Joe going through the world and, and just trying to create a phenomenal power for himself, but just really getting slapped down really hard the whole time because he doesn't have a quick growth character. So he is just so much weaker than the other characters at the start. Um, and so it just made for, it made for a super fun, 
uh, series and it's gonna, I'm going to continue writing it probably for another five years just to get to that 20th book. Um, and, and then, uh, yeah, we'll see where it goes from there. Okay. So, mm -hmm. um, what, uh, system of Dungeons and Dragons do you play? Oh, 3.5. Okay. Oh yeah. Uh, so most of the good ones are. Yeah, that's true. Like that's I love two E I love two, but five E is just not my, not my jam. Don't worry, they'll really make it like all worse from 6.0. Yeah, I'm sure. We're kind of... <laughs> yeah, we're just going to leave that with the pukey face. All right, so this is the section where we talk about the uh, the book cover. So can you tell us the story of this epic uh, piece of artwork? Uh, sure, man. <laughs> so uh, uh, this is Joe. <laughs> and... So this is the audiobook cover. So it has a little bit less definition than the standard one. Um, so what's going on in this in this photo is he just got a perk that is as much of a bane as it is a boon. Um, so on his forehead, he has a third glowing eye right there, right? Um, kind of the all-seeing eye of Horus, right? And uh, so he is under attack by this massive army and like he's trying to defend the stronghold because his whole system is like his whole system is geared around the buildings and stuff that he can make and, and stuff like that stuff that he can create out of rituals. Right. And um, if they take that down, he'll be put like put back to a terrible, terrible spot. And, and so this is him striding out using a, a bonus that he just got where um, whenever he's attacked, he, they it, it kind of reflects a little bit of damage. So what actually happens is that a, a, a kind of a shadow clone of himself appears in front of whoever attacked him and just slaps him across the face. <laughs> so this is him activating a, a, a gigantic ritual um, that it labels him as a ruthless person um, as he steps out into combat. And uh, so it's it's a super fun, super fun book. Yep. <laughs> Most of my most of my spells in combat are slightly pun based, but it's a thing. Jr. So, so you had dad jokes before you were even a dad. Is that what you're telling me? Oh man, absolutely. So it it was good that uh, my kid came along when she did because otherwise, like all of these jokes, they would just been like DAC jokes instead of dad jokes, and they were way worse. DAC jokes is not one I've heard before. Well, Dakota, D A K, Dak jokes. Oh, oh, oh okay. Ah. All right, I can dig it. I can dig it. It is a glorious cover. I'm assuming. It's a dad uh, joke I, in and of itself. <laughs> I, uh, a lot of the details are lost to my colorblind backside, so okay. we're going to pretend it's glorious. Uh, but let's talk about the book itself. So, what would your 30 second elevator pitch be for Ruthless? For Ruthless, um, not Ruthless. Is that the right cover? Ritualist. Well, we put up Ruthless. We were going to talk about Ritualist. Um, Oops! I showed you the wrong cover. Oops. Hey, it's cool. It's a great. It's a great. I mean, cover. he still knows his book covers. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, that was the fifth book in the series. So, I was a little surprised that one went up, but that's cool. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna say. Google no. did not like Fair you. I typed in. Been getting a lot of <laughs> that's okay. Yeah. I get it. We get the Rona running through the family. It's okay. We'll figure it out. Huh. All right. Let me pull the right one up. But uh, where, what was the um, <laughs> thirty second elevator pitch? Be sure um so 30 second elevator pitch it's a, so um you know uh basically is the the question is, that everyone wants to know is if i were to be put into a new place a new world and have any option available to me the same options that everyone else has would i be as intelligent as i think i am would i succeed in the way that i believe i would if everyone were at zero right and um, what would it take to gain that power, right? What would it take to walk the long path, the hard path to becoming really, truly powerful instead of strong? And so with Ritualist, um, he, in this, in this first book, he starts walking that path of power in pursuit of power and true, like just like really, really becoming the most powerful wizard in the world. 
right? And seeing as this is a game world and that other people have been here for thousands of years, um, it's it's a very difficult path. Um, so uh, with Ritualist, he it, it, like as you can see in the cover here, since so that was my elevator pitch, and now I'm kind of moving back into um, what's going on. Um, in this, it kind of introduces the enemies that he's facing, which are wolfmen, as you can kind of see tucked up in the left corner there. Um, and they're, you know, what, what he's trying to do is save the human kingdom, even if they don't want to be saved. And, uh, so, uh, he's performing what is considered taboo magic, which is ritual magic, right? Uh, and it's considered taboo because they're, because anyone can do it. And so the mages are like the mages college is very unhappy that there is a, a, a loose ritualist. And so the, the story here is actually a uh, man versus. I don't know if you can hear me, Dakota, but but we lost you once you said the story here is man versus, and then you froze again. What were those cards, Doc? You mute. You muted yourself. It's the dragon card tarot deck. It, I needed something to do with my hands. Yeah, I heard you shuffling. It's cool. Welcome back, Dakota. We How lost you at man versus. <laughs> so he's talking about ritual magic and why that wasn't popular. Talked for so long because everyone was moving on my end. Oh, so so sorry. Bad. We've never had this happen. No, it's fine. I... And we lost him again. Adam. Hello. We've never what? Okay, we there we you had are. you. We've never had this happen before. And then you froze again. Yeah, I don't know what's going on. Because my, like, my internet shows a stable... So I'm I'm really concerned with like this. Okay, so would you like me to continue? Yes, yeah. absolutely. I mean, if this is gonna be the okay. your only real chance, I figure we rock on. Sorry, man. Okay, so he's using ritual magic, right? Okay, so pause. Eh, eh, eh. So uh, Joe is using ritual magic, which is considered a taboo form of magic not because it's like dark or evil or anything like that, but because it is unregulated, right? So, which is kind of the whole point of this book, right? It's not about or birth position or whatever it is. Um, Seska, I need you to move around a little because I think you're frozen. Okay. Uh, <laughs> and um, like, so it's the whole premise of this is that, <clears throat> you know, with this series, it's, it's an exploration of what could we do if we just had the capability, if we just had the time, if we just had, you know, if we started at the same point as everyone else, how much further would we rise, right? And, and that's just kind of why the series is so fun. Okay. <laughs> All right. So that was a good answer. And um, our poor editor is going to have his work cut out I'm for him. Sorry, so man. <laughs> it happens. We're going to pay for his Christmas single handedly. So moving on to the book itself. Oh, you gave you're going to make your... Dakota feel so bad. Nah. nah. <laughs> they had those feelings removed at the Corporal Academy. I have that on good authority. So uh, moving back to the story. So what is it you think makes the uh, Completionist Chronicles and specifically the Ritualist so uh, special? 
Um, I, I mean, you know, a lot of it would be parroting my parroting myself. Like, uh, obviously, it's special because I wrote it, and it's amazing, right? Um, <laughs> um, but realistically, like, uh, my whole brand is dad jokes, bad puns, fun stuff like that. And so, uh, one of one of my stuff is that I really go for the escapism, right? I, I go for um, having a good time over having a really dark and serious story. You know, like if if something gets too tense, there's always a joke to lighten it up. If, if there's, you know, if it gets too heavy, like there's always something going on to, to break that tension and, and let things move along in a realistic but also fun way. And I think that I I am able to capture the escapism better than than most people. And I would say that's what really um, makes my series attractive. So. Okay. I know this is a little off topic, but, but well, I'll ask this later when we get into more of the character <laughs> stuff. So, um, obviously, this is a lit RPG story, but where do you think it fits in the subgenre real world other than just in lit RPG? In the real world? No, like in the world of subgenres, you know, oh. like w other than just lit RPG, where do you feel it fits? Um, you know, I would say that it fits in epic fantasy pretty, uh, pretty dang well. Um, I usually hit number one on epic fantasy when I release a new book in the series. Okay. So, um, so there for sure. Um, it is not really high fantasy because a lot of times high fantasy is more of a, um, what's the word I'm looking for? High fantasy is a lot more of a soft magic system like Tolkien mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, so it doesn't really fit super well there, but it could kind of. Um, depends on how well you understand math. Like if you don't understand math, this could totally be a soft magic system for you. You're just like, hey man, I have no idea what's happening, how this magic works. It's so wild. if you're like JR in that. <laughs> I feel attacked. <laughs> it's okay, JR, for when you're feeling correctly. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, like puns and wordplay, fun, fun stuff like that. Like I... I don't <clears throat> I don't really go too wild for like the name brand categories you know I, I like to target kind of smaller funnier things like um like genetic engineering and stuff like that um you know just I, I I do serious stuff so that I can you know get the best algorithm best sales but also I always end up in kind of categories that make me chuckle all at the same time so that stuff works. like that um yeah there's a lot going on with these books. <laughs> so can you tell us a bit about our the main character here? Sure. Um, so this is Joe. <laughs> Joe's very nice. He's a coffee addict. Um, <laughs> and to the point where he eventually um, gets a familiar and it's a coffee elemental, right? Um, nice. I like that. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> um, Tell me about this coffee uh, elemental, because now I'm intrigued. <laughs> well, now imagine imagine a creature that lives in a coffee stain on your sleeve, and can pop out at any time and and inject caffeine directly into your bloodstream. You sold me. All right, keep going. <laughs> All right. Um. So. Um. So Joe is. You know, he starts out. He. Uh, actually, it kind of mimics some of my own time in the military, which is funny because, like, the first chapter, the first couple, the first chapter, or so or so is uh, him getting blown out of the sky, right? Um, in uh, I'm trying to remember where it's written in the book, but I think it's Kuwait, and you know, like getting uh, brought back to America, like super messed up, super damaged, and he gets a chance for essentially a new life, right? And he jumps at that chance, well, as much as he can, because. Yeah. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> kind of darker than I normally get into. Um, but, you know, like uh, it goes for it. And so he uploads his his consciousness into this game and all of a sudden has unlimited time. Right. And so he takes the time to carefully plan his future and take actionable, you know, make actionable steps and, and achieve them. And so like that's kind of Joe in this. So. Joe in the real world um, was a good friend of mine, um, and uh, he uh, he died 
<laughs> and uh, his his uh, parents. At, I was I was looking for a main character's name, and uh, his dad asked me to use uh, Joe's name. So that is what I did. So yeah, that's really deep because yeah. um, and really kind of awesome. Um, you we you do have those characters and those, mm -hmm. and they are characters sometimes when you meet them in the service. Oh yes, who <laughs> just stick with you for forever. Right. So, um, and that's really awesome that he's mm -hmm. getting in second life, literally in your books. Yeah. I'm, I'm a firm believer that nobody's really dead as long as we keep their memory alive. Sure. Uh, I, you know, so I really think that's, that's kind of a cool way to, I mean, this guy's eternal now because mm -hmm. this book will exist in digital ether space. Yeah. That's good stuff. So I guess <laughs> when we ask the question about if the characters knew that you were the one putting them through the paces, this guy would give you a hug. <laughs> I'd hope so. <laughs> Some of the stuff that he has to run into, man, like there's a whole section on like spiders that have their legs replaced with hypodermic needles that drop down. What the um, fuck, dude? <laughs> <laughs> so, because what I was trying to do is I was trying to find. I'm going to have that in my dreams tonight. You know right. that, right? Yeah. So now here's the other thing, though. The way they actually kill people is like, because they're they're dungeon monsters, right? Um, they drop down and they like grab on and they paralyze whoever they grab. And then three or four of them will then zip back up on their strings and they'll chuck the person into the sky. And then they, they actually die from fall damage. Right. You're the kind of dungeon master players cuss at after you kill their favorite character. <laughs> yeah. So that, that particular scene was, I was exploring phobias because um, like one of the, one of the characters broke a big taboo in game and then, um, it created an instant dungeon as like the karma in immediately shifted and and uh, threw them into like the worst thing that their mind could imagine. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'm pretty sure that character <laughs> might be related to my mother. Ha. <laughs> we won't tell her you said that. You can tell her she said that. Sure. She doesn't listen to any of the podcasts. Uh, oh, and by the way, the taboo thing that they broke. Uh, the taboo in that instance was they promised a reward for a quest if they if he could complete it, and then he completed the quest and they couldn't pay up, and so the game immediately punished them. <laughs> I mean, I can appreciate that actually. Yep. So. Yep. Yep. All right, Doc. Keep this keep this going before he freezes again. Uh, I know, right? Since <laughs> he is Mister Freeze tonight. Uh so. Cool. Are there any super uh, secondary characters you want to talk to us about tonight? Sure. Yeah, I have a, I have a lot of really cool secondary characters in in Completions Chronicles. <laughs> Part of it is because I can, you know, bring in stuff from like the real world and kind of fuse our imagination and 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 you know stuff that's going on in in real life. Um, but I have uh, one guy. So one of my favorite characters is Jackson, and I, I mentioned him earlier with the T Rex head hands. So he is a caricature of my brother-in-law, who is the most calm and stoic, one-level dude I've ever met in my life. He's a chiropractor and a, and a uh, acupuncturist, right? There is something about chiropractors. I think they make them become calm. You know, when you have someone's life in your hand like that at all times, I think you're just like, you know what? It's fine. I could kill you. It's cool. <laughs> yeah that that would that would probably be why there's so few chiropractors i'm willing to see yeah well th that's why they're so calm is they have to be like if they, they can't work angry you know <laughs> or they just get their anger out by torturing people like let me bend no, you this no, no, away i'm pretty sure like how my ncos dealt with their anger it's really good it's a very healthy thing for your body so i, I highly recommend it um i've even gotten acupuncture with him it's not super fun but it's a thing that is helpful um, so anyway, so I took this super calm, relaxed dude, and I just made him a super caricature of that. And so he's like, Oh, hello, my name is Jackson and I'm wonderful. Oh, also, oh yeah. So like, he's just like super out there. Right. <laughs> but as it turns out, like in the book, like he turns out he's like a 95 year old man that got into the game, into the a body of a young man now. And he's like, I can pursue my craft again. But you know what? I don't really have all of these hangups that you youngins do. And so um, he goes out and just has a, a grand old time, you know. Um, 
exploring his his craft in a new way. And the the T Rex head hands are a direct result of him wanting to be able to adjust people as well as give them acupuncture at the exact same time. <laughs> I mean, because why not? Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I've noticed okay. the voices. I've noticed the voices that you do. So do you read your own audiobooks? No, oh, no, 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 no. Um, I'm I'm getting a sore throat just from talking this much, man. Um, I do I do words well with my hands. Um, <laughs> no, I uh, originally when I was when I was a lot younger, I wanted to um, I wanted to be a voice actor, right? So I, I have all sorts of different voices that I can do, um, like characters. Like Mel Brooks was my hero, you know, like the Man of a Thousand Voices did all the Looney Tunes and all that stuff. Mel Brooks, yeah. Um, am I saying that right? I don't know. I don't think it's Mel Brooks. No. Um, hang on. Now I have to look this up. I'm tired. That's what, that's the real issue here. Um, Mel Blanc. That's what it is. Mel Blanc. But <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so he did 60 years of stuff. So he was, he was Bugs Bunny. He was like all these guys. Right. Um, and so like just being able to do all that stuff, um, was always super fun. Unfortunately, uh, some of my, some things happened in the army where my throat got pretty messed up. <laughs> so, um, I'm not able to really speak for really long periods of time. I'm not really, um, able to, uh, have a, a great, great control of my voice, which is why I try to keep it pretty one level when I'm talking for long periods of time. Well, then we appreciate you doing the interview with us. Oh, no, I love I love this sort of thing. I do. It's just that um, it's uh, yeah. Anyway, so yeah, it, it, it's it's all good. But uh, I think I, I told you before we started, you know, like most of my stories of the military end very tragically. So it's like yeah, the military tends to do that to us. Yeah. 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 So um, it's like, hey, this is a fun and like hilarious thing that I can remember. Also, it really messed me up, you know, <laughs> like stuff like that. Like, yep. hey, that was a that was a great ruck march, but someone put bleach in my uh, in my camelback. So oh, wow. <laughs> stuff like that. So, yeah, good times. I mean, I, mean, I had the ruck march where I pretty much blacked out dur visually during it. You know, yeah, <laughs> I got sent to sick call after that one. Mm hmm. All right, so uh, moving on. So, what about you talked about about some of your secondary characters that you like? What about the bad guys? Um, without spoilers, dude. obviously, what kind of bad guys are they facing? Dude, my my bad guys all have a reason that they're a bad guy, right? And <clears throat> essentially, they're all just at cross purposes with the main character, right? Um, I'm a firm believer that no one wants to hold you down; they just don't care, right? So they want to go up and up and up and if you get pushed down by dint of them climbing and going and becoming stronger reaching higher heights however they are doing this that's what's going to happen like they don't have like bad guys don't have malice toward any in one individual in general right they just they just don't care who they hurt okay um and so my bad guys have really good reasons for what they do they really do um, except for Barry, Barry sucks. Um, <laughs> um, but, uh, oh. like even, even my character, even my characters that are like, I have only one character in all of my books that is actually insane. And that is because that is how he gets stronger by collecting insanity. Right. And so it's really hey. funny because yeah, because he, he goes and he gets stronger by going around and finding people that are crazy and taking back their insanity so he can have it for himself. Right? Oh, I don't <laughs> you would I have would a field day with the Martyrn Army. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, my, my, my bad guys are pretty dang fun, man. Would you let them come over to your house for tea? Or whatever you drink in Kansas, yeah. Um, all of them except for Barry. Yes. <laughs> Barry's not even the one that cultivates insanity. No, so that's uh, that guy's name is Zenocide. Because <laughs> that sounds like a stable, healthy name. Well, he got that name because uh, he exterminated an, an entire race of creatures, gnomes, um, because they were.
were dipping into insanity to make cooler inventions and they wouldn't stop when he told them to stop. So he went and took his insanity back by killing them all. So, yep. <laughs> he sounds like a warm kettle fella. He is. He actually really is. Like he's a very, he's very fun. He's a very fun character. He's just insane. Not like, oh, you're insane, but more like we, the people find the defendant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, that kind of insane. Um, but you very the word fun. I don't think that word means what you think it means. <laughs> right. But he does fun things because he's, you know, fun. Uh, Barry is, is just a jerk because he has a big ch chip on his shoulder. And he's, he's the only character in my books really as a bad guy. That is like, all he does is take what other people have to become stronger. So he'll like, take their life he'll take their stuff he'll take all their stuff whatever it is like he'll that's how he gets stronger is just pure killing and so he's okay with that yeah no okay. he's boring you know yeah he is he is like, not the type not not like that he's a boring character he is but more like <clears throat> boring as in um not the type of person you want to hang out with right and um, he's a tedious person. That's really what it is. Because he's very, very strict and regimented and very, very boring. And then at the end of the day, he still kills whoever he's doing stuff with. And it's like, ah, you're the worst. And it's like, not even like a fun bad guy. He's just like, he's he's the guy that we point to when we're like, all right, throw the bucket of water over the Wicked Witch. That's, yep, right there. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyway. Okay, so this is the part where you get to show us behind the curtain. Uh, so, you know, that's my <laughs> my obligatory pun and dad joke, if you would. I don't know if it qualifies, but we're just going to go with it. So were there any cool scenes that uh, got cut when you were writing this first book, Ritualist, that uh, make a cool story? Oh, yeah. Um, in fact, so there were, there were a couple of ideas that I had that just didn't fit the magic system for this series. And I turned them into other series. <laughs> so... Nice. Oh, absolutely. I, I don't I don't I, throw away ideas, man. <laughs> I don't I, I approve. So like I've never written a short story that I didn't want to turn into a series. So I can kind of feel, you know, you don't want to waste the word. Uh, I would say that two of my absolute favorite novels of all time started as short stories that became series. Nice. The Rowan and the Tower was originally a short story, as well as uh in McCaffrey's titular work, The Dragonflight. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's a good fantasy novel. So finally, um, what, can me. You, <laughs> what can you tell us about the universe? So in many series, the place where the story is told they is as much. Guys. Hush. Uh, the place where the story is told is as much a character as the antagonist and protagonist. So can you give us a little bit of a hint of this, um, this game that he sucked into? Sure. So in this case, the world actually is a person, which is kind of fun. So uh, this is a a sequel series from my original divine dungeon series and um the game is actually the the dungeon core from divine dungeon who has created a universe within itself instead of just being a base dungeon after several million years just absorbing energy right and uh so then it you know is it's on earth and it uh gets touched to uh the internet and it downloads it and then it says, oh, I can do that. And so then it makes like turns uh, a lot of its stuff into like game like uh, situations. And um, so the the world itself is a living creature, right? I, I almost said breathing, but no, because it's a rock. Um, but like the actual game itself is a creature, right? Um, so that's that's one of the, the cool things that's going to be explored a little bit more as we go on with the series. So can you get a little bit more into dun what exactly what makes something dungeon core? Like that's a subset of lit RPG, right? Sure. Yeah. So, <clears throat> um, so uh, dungeon core is um, when you are creating a place, right? So it is a sentient place, right? Okay. So it has, it has like it has like a single unified mind that designs everything. But uh, like like if uh, like a divine dungeon, like he hollows out a mountain and, and turns it into a huge 
amount of like different floors and traps and all this like fills it with monsters and all of it is controlled by one mind which is within which is the dungeon core right mm -hmm. and it it holds a huge amount of power and all this other stuff so it's like um, an ai core but it's a dungeon exactly right um and it it's all it's also like it's like a cross between ai core and like a live nuke right because yeah I, <laughs> I think star trek next gen actually had an episode where like the holodeck basically went rogue and did its yes. own thing yep basically like uh, it's a lot like that so okay. dun yeah dungeon core the 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 challenge with that is that you can't travel out all all conflict has to come from without and come in right because you don't get to see out of the dungeon you don't get to follow adventures outside of the dungeon so does the dungeon actually level up or just the characters yes. within the dungeon uh both do that okay so yes the dungeon gets stronger by eating the people that come through it well, you know, I so get the, eating the fish. So That's can it. the dungeon be defeated? So yeah. if someone beats the dungeon, does the dungeon itself die? So if someone kills the dungeon, then yes. So you have to destroy the core. Otherwise, all of the like stuff gets reset over time. Um, <clears throat> and the reason they don't do that is so long as the dungeon doesn't have like unbeatable challenges, right? So as long as there's a, a path to victory, they'll always go for that um otherwise they'll send in an unextermination squad to take out the dungeon because it's too dangerous right um so they want the treasure they want the the easy access to experience or cultivation key in this uh, case um because they can use the refined experience essentially that's coming off of the dungeon to get stronger themselves way faster than they could just hunting monsters in the real world right and so that's okay. why people go into dungeons. That's the bit, place where you can find the best loot, the best, um, the best the most treasure, the best leveling, because that's where the dungeon is. Yeah. Yep. So, so the people are trapped there permanently, though. That means they are always stuck there in the dungeon. Um, so the dungeon, so in Completionist Chronicles, is the entire world, right? And so it's not something that's really super explored early on. Um, because it's a tie-in to a previous series, you don't need to read the other series to do to like to read this one, right? Uh, very, very carefully, they are very separate things with very different cast. But it's something that will come up because, like, why does the world have all these customized messages to me when I level up? Like, why is it snarky? Why is it making fun of me? All this other stuff is because it's the game is literally a living thing. Right. And so that's that's more of how it is um, important to the story. Okay. okay. So it sounds complicated. Can we read the Completionist Chronicles universe without having read the Divine Dungeon? Yes, absolutely. Okay. Color me intrigued. So I grew up playing like RPGs on computer. So like Skyrim, Morrowind, and the like. I know my uh, Dungeons and Dragons aficionados tell me those don't count. Uh, but they've never taken an arrow to the knee and lost their ability to be an adventurer. So they just don't uh -huh. understand. But uh, so if, if somebody is coming at it from like a Dungeons and Dragons or uh, or the RPG on the computer, are they going to have the same experience with it and be able to relate to it? Oh, absolutely. Yep. Yes. Both, both of those. Yes, very much so. Okay. So what kind of creatures, because I feel like we talked a lot about you and we talked a lot about, you know, the kind of stories you like, but we haven't, dove in enough on the actual story, the Completionist Chronicles or the Ritualist. So what sort of monsters do they expect in this dungeon? Is it your standard generic fantasy trope type stuff? Do you create your own stuff? <coughs> um, so the monsters are as varied as the biomes, right? So, cause uh, it, it's a dungeon, but it's a, it's a whole universe, right? All within one thing. So they're going through these, planes of existence that are as big as any planet and um all of them have you know super varied monsters everything from like poisonous snakes to um uh uh manicores to chimeras to like unicorns that are really really angry at certain things i don't know um but yeah i mean like the whole the whole thing is that it's you you don't know what to expect, but once you've been to an area, you have a pretty good idea of what should be in that area. Right. Okay. Okay. So do do um, unicorns make good steaks? I mean, I've heard rumors. Yes. 
Very good. Very delicious. All right. I just got to get that clear because, you know, it's important to define terms. Yeah. Because, hey, man, if you've ever had a unicorn gorilla steak for you, you'll know that they make it perfectly. Oh, I see what you did there. I was asking <laughs> how they tasted, but that works too. With their so, tongues. Yeah. It's, it's a rumor that when an author gets every every hundredth review, they get a free unicorn. So I'm just hoping enough authors will get enough that we can have like a unicorn steak party and then we'll just, we'll know. We need those answers. All right. And then like uh, Reading Rainbow taught us, take a look. It's in a book. And that's where the answer lies. Too corny for you, Doc? You did say you like dad jokes. <laughs> oh, my God. There's a reason I'm divorced. I don't have to hear the dad jokes. I could teach uh, Viking and the dad jokes for you. I could he set something up. won't say them right. It'll be okay. They're, they're infinitely cuter coming out of him than you. Ooh, I'll take that and we'll move on. All right. So when you look for inspirations for, you said that the the biome of the various places within the dungeon affect the kind of monsters you populate there. Mm -hmm. So as the creator of this universe, do you, like how do you pick when you're when you're picking? Like, is there any metric you use? Oh, I like this. It's cool. Let me figure it out. Or is there like a method to your madness? Absolutely, there is. Um, so I have a big sheet of numbers. I roll for it. I approve. I like this. Yep, very much so. Like I, I choose biome, monster type, all, all, all that stuff, like um, kind of what sort of trait they get. Um, like they could be uh, like in this case, it's a unhesitating disease vector um, on a tundra uh, with a void attribute. So um, so like it, it, it's something that can move through like it's a teleporting creature that could um uh transmit disease on the tundra right so just just like that just boom 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 boom, boom like along these different sheets so here. uh in the pre-show you showed us your excel sheet so is there any point in time where it sounds like almost you've already built an rpg is that that going to be for sale at any point in time uh, i mean the hope but the hope is there <laughs> I, I i mean i believe it would do well I, I think people would like it um it's a matter of what is my time best invested in at any given time, and uh, it, currently, it is in writing and generating content and in making more of this. Um, so I can always I can always work with someone else to create the game and do it, following my manuals, <laughs> and then still just can be able con to continue writing because being an author is what I want to do. Everything else is gravy. All right, and this is going to be a little bit out. Uh, we'll link it in the show notes later because he does have a Patreon. Is there any level of Patreon support that lets them say, I really like this book. I want the dice you rolled for this scene. And you could just like give them your, the dice you rolled to do that. No. Like, give like, them the physical item. dice or give them like I rolled X, Y, and Z. No, like the physical dice that he rolled. I rolled these dice and this is the dice that killed your favorite I mean, character. Man. Do you think people would want that? Because I, I don't know. I just think it's it's kind of a neat idea. I've, I've it, it heard is kind of a neat idea. I've heard um, authors talk about using like randomly flipping to a page in the monster manual and picking, but like the idea that you have a whole dice encounter generator. All I could think is why are you stealing this guy's dice? <laughs> I mean, he could buy more. I've, I've used these same Gamer? dice for. Five they years on this now, six years. Particular yeah. about their dice. <laughs> I have I've dice that had. routinely roll badly, so I've never gotten that attached. I have never uh, had anyone ask for my dice before. That's a new one. Yeah. Uh, I, I, like I had a, uh, I had a set of dice that always seemed to roll to kill my ex husband whenever the kitchen was dirty. I'm Funny not even that kidding. Works. The only time I've ever rolled natural twenty. <laughs> Okay, so uh, we will move along because we don't need to talk about killing axes. So <laughs> it was in we, the game. Sure, sure. That's what the Mr. FBI man. If you're listening, it was totally in the game. Uh, so we know every literary universe has its own internally consistent rules of science, technology, and magic. Uh, you've mentioned a little bit about the, the almost the game within a game you've you've actually built instead of just winging it. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? About kind of like how I've designed the system, or. Yeah, yeah, the system that the game, the stories populate around. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I have three, three big sections. Um, one of them is character, and then one of them is skills, and one of them is, um, shoot. Uh, so character, skills, and um, uh, uh, shoot, hang on, because they're they're so I use them so often that I often don't just don't even look at it. So one second. Um, 
so the character, their stat. Oh yeah, so the character as a person, the stat sheet of that character, as well as the skills of the character. Okay, so the character as a as a person. What I actually do is I do a full um, psychological workup for each each main character, right? Oh, um, okay. So yeah, so like I do like um, um, I, I make up their. Um, Enagrams, I make up their um, like psychological profiles, stuff like that. And then I try to use that to guide how I write them and guide the decision making that they do, right? Because if someone is of a certain personality type or if they're of a, um, you know, however, however it is that they think, um, I don't know. Like I have just my personality to go off of. And so using, using actual psychology to guide how someone is written has been really beneficial to me. Um, second thing is the character sheet and that, that it impacts like how they, how they can do things like how far they can run, how far they can, like how hard they can punch, how many spells they can use, so on and so forth. And then the third one is skills and or skills or spells, which are the actual abilities that they have throughout the books. Right. Um, so all of those intertwine a lot so when i'm when i'm creating any new character that's gonna be a main character especially all of that has to be taken into account um so it's it's very unlikely that someone with a you know very calm secretive um mentality is gonna get into you know like throwing fireballs around right it just <laughs> it just doesn't make sense for that character you know that character archetype unless you're trying to buck a trend, you know, unless you're like trying to intentionally subvert the um, trope, right? Um, most likely you'd see that person as like a stealthy archer or uh, ice guy, someone throwing around. They're more know, likely like, to do magic darts than fire bolts. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's stuff like that, like everyone gets it, but having it codified really helps. Yeah. Um, yeah, so that's that's kind of how I how I look at things when I'm setting up a, any any system. So okay. typically we ask about what tech did you invent for this universe that you would want to steal or use, but we'll expand this because you've got kind of like the tech aspect that's kind of the intro level and then, but you got also the magic. So which one would you steal and use on a daily basis? Oh man, I would use the magic like you wouldn't believe. So, so how would you, how would you use and abuse it? All right, man. So first off, uh, healing Other than sleep spells to get baby to nap. <coughs> totally all about that. No, there's just a hand symbol. You press your finger against your head and you fall asleep. Like, how do you fall asleep? Well, that's a, that's a complicated <laughs> story involving a low. Nice. No, um, so I, I know exactly what I would do if I had access to any magic I want. So basically, so he starts the game as a, as a healer, right? So um, healers have this awesome ability to not only heal damage that's done by weapons, but damage that's done by time, right? So a healer, oh, okay. So, so a healer can heal someone back to perfect health, whatever that is, right? Oh, nice. Right. So if they start at like 90 and you can just keep healing them until they get to perfect health. So like body of currently in, uh oh. I can, I'm here. Okay, cool. You stopped moving into me. It, it always makes me nervous because he's, yeah. Um, and then, so perfect health forever would be an awesome thing and being able to heal other people to people. Yeah. Perfect health. And then I would abuse the portal system like you wouldn't believe. Like I would create portals um, where I would take a chunk of metal and I would, uh, of iron, and I would drop it through and then I would wrap, you know, uh, I would wrap um, copper around it and then have infinite power generation forever, right? Just via gravity. And then following that, I would jumpstart humanities uh, using the same portal system. I would jumpstart humanities uh, traversal into the universe uh, and exploration by being able to create portals and just drop stuff into space, right? And it doesn't even how, matter how far away from the planet I could get it as long as no, it's No, you can get it out of yeah. Most of the fuel is used just getting out of orbit. Exactly. Getting so up, just getting up. So if then we had, you know, the ability to traverse space and had the ability to maintain perfect health forever, um, that's what I would do. <laughs> like I would just go out Hell and just yeah. the universe. Yep. 
I'm thinking much more mundane things like, well, you know, the dishes would be clean, <laughs> baby would be napping. <laughs> well, I I gotta say I don't I don't get where I am by thinking of the little things. And <laughs> they aren't little. You're a dad. I'm a mom. Those are huge. No, no, no. no, they're huge things. No, don't don't get me wrong. Like my my lovely wife and I really work hard to make sure that both of us are really involved in our kids' life. Oh yeah. Um, however, um, what I mean by that is I like my mind is always focused on like big picture, what can we do? And then um oh, like yeah. the the minutia, the the maintenance, the uh taking care of things over time really escapes me. I just don't have I'm just not built <laughs> for it. And so my my wonderful wife and I have extremely complementary strengths where I'm always pushing the bounds of what we can or should do. And she's the one who um keeps everything um working and flowing in a really smooth manner like she's absolutely wonderful so as as you know she's amazing i I absolutely (laughs) adore her she's amazing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so me too i'm also amazing (laughs) i'm just kidding you're also also amazing too but we already know (laughs) you're amazing (sighs) um and he's oh so humble everyone says so (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> number one at the top of the humble list yeah yeah so we've already kind of talked about how you go about creating your creatures but did you design anything specific for this like that was inspired out of like a dream or a nightmare you know um i guess like i don't you, understand the question uh, so you talked about how you roll a dice to come yeah. up with some of the things but do you I, JR, help me here. I'm tired. So, so like, sorry, this is, you're going to hear the edited version, but this has lasted longer than normal. Internets hate us tonight. So what I think what she's asking is you've talked a little bit about, you've got a dice system, you roll the dice, it tells you what they're encountering, where they're encountering it, how they're encountering it. But how do you go about creating that system that you use? So that way, did you create the chart? So when you roll, you've got the table. Did you use something from a, a game? No, I, how did I, you come I up with it? I created it all. Um, so just, uh, you know, a, a lot of it is, <sighs> a lot of it is, you know, real biomes. A lot of it is, you know, stuff that's just kind of whatever things that come to mind. Um, monsters and stuff. I don't know, man. Like a lot of it is just what's in my head at whatever given point in time. Right. Like um, I went into a, a salt mine right in one of my in uh, one of the, one of the books in completionist chronicles because you know they would do nuclear tests in real life they would do nuclear tests in uh, abandoned salt mines right and so when i had this really big nasty ritual that i wanted to practice i sent him down into a salt mine to go and practice it right and uh while he was down there you know because he's in a salt mine uh stuff is popping out of the walls to attack them and they're you know creatures made of salt right and so what happened is whenever they they all they all did like cutting damage so you know so they whenever you got cut then you had salt in your wound as well and so it really super sucked and then like um and salt burns crystals that that can be pretty hard yeah exactly and so, like, you know, you get down to the boss level and er- everything is a pun at that point, right? Like, um, there's a... I approve, um, by the way, of pun. Yeah. Like, there's there's a, a giant Russian man who, who who is one of the bosses and a, a vampire, um, a vampire, and they're all made of salt, a vampire named Terry, right? So you have Os, Salt, and Bat Terry, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I like where your mind is going, but your poor wife. So do you do you draw on her knowledge of chemistry and fake sciences? No, no. She, she, <laughs> she does not help me with the um, writing process. Um, beyond JR, writing. chemistry is a real science. It's one you use to live. <laughs> I mean, I took Betty Crocker chemistry, like chemistry you for non-science. You did not take chemistry. Leaders. You took how to mix a baked cake. I think we made ice cream in class once. That was chemistry too, right? But anyway, <laughs> it's fun to watch your brain break, Dakota. So <laughs> clearly we've been at this for a little bit, uh, and this is, is winding down. We appreciate a look into your process in this world. Uh, you had mentioned that these books are available in audiobook and ebook and all of the things. 
Um, but was there anything about the Ritualist or the Completionist Chronicles that we didn't ask that you wanted to tell us before we wrap this up? No. Like, we're so, <laughs> so this is the part where you, where you were like, you guys are so excellent. You thought of everything and I'm totally amazed. Exactly right. Right, right. I'll have to write exactly the script correct. for you to say next time, so that way you, you guys, know. you guys are amazing. No, this is why this is why I am awesome <laughs> on panels. Is if I don't have anything to say, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut. Um. Uh, you know, if I had learned that skill, I might have actually made staff sergeant. You might have <laughs> kept your rank and not been a corporal a couple times. But you know, they say if you if you weren't demoted at least once, did you really live in the army? But that's the old army. I don't know if they do it that way. Yeah, anymore. I did live. I didn't get okay, we'll, we'll go with that. So before we wrap this up, <laughs> I did hint that every 100th review, the author gets a unicorn. And if we get enough, we can we can have a unicorn steak off and figure out the best recipes and whether Worcestershire sauce or Heinz 57 or what works best for those steaks or, or regular ketchup if you're basic, which is cool too. No, no, Heinz uh, 57 is just ketchup. It's, it's Heinz. It's, it's ketchup. Yeah, true, true. But not everyone knows that, so we try to humor them. So... So I'd like to harken back to our the way we ended our episodes with the sci-fi shenanigans is please be kind and speak your mind on the reviewing platforms. Your reviews help the right readers find the right books. And seriously, even, even bad reviews, if you say why you didn't like something can help. Uh, been plenty of times where a bad review sold me on a book. Like too much cussing, dude, I'm there. Right? Like, you know, gratuitous <laughs> violence, military sci-fi. All right, you're doing it right. Let me buy that one. So, you know, if, if you didn't like it, it's not for you. That's cool. But, you know, just tell people why and you can help people pick books. Life is too short to read bad books. So you're, you're doing the world of service. Your fellow reader thanks you in advance. All right. So, Dakota, before we uh, before we close, you got to tell everyone where they can find you on the wild, wild interwebs. Oh, man. Um, so I'm all over the place. You can find me. I'm most active on Facebook. So if you <clears throat> if you type in Dakota Kraut or Mountain Dale Press, I'm at both of those places a lot. Um, and other than that, I'm uh, also equally uh, all the time on Discord, right? So Discord, I'm there all the time. I actually write there publicly. So when I'm when I am writing, I have about five days. Uh, uh, I try to do five days a week. I will show up on Discord and write there the entire time that I'm writing. So you can see me. You can see the words appearing. You can talk with me as I'm doing it. So that's a pretty fun place. Uh, Patron is where you can see um, uh, chapters appear ahead of time. So like you can uh, get access to books that aren't yet published, stuff like that. Um, and that's patron.com forward slash Dakota Kraut. Um, and yeah, man, I'm, I'm on Twitter, Instagram, Wherever, wherever you want to find me, just type in Dakota Kraut and, and do a quick search and you'll find me. Okay. And Doc, are you ready to try today? Tell them where they can find us or you want me to, you want me to handle this for you? No, it's just much more fun mocking you. Okay. I figured you would say that. All right. Um, you can find us on our website at anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades. Anchor.fm backslash blasters dash and dash blades. You can find us on the Twitters at twitter.com backslash SF underscore fantasy underscore show. Again, Sierra Foxtrot underscore fantasy underscore show. We have the email at blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. Again, blasters and blades podcast at gmail.com. We even check it sometimes once a day. Uh, if you want to send the hate mail, send it to Doc Seska at blastersandbladespodcast.com. She loves all of your snarky comments, so please like just unload. She really loves it when you do. Uh, we have a Facebook group where all the shenanigans happen, facebook.com backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Again, backslash groups backslash blasters and blades podcast. Be sure to tell her why pineapple on pizza is wrong. And if you write it as a soliloquy, you get bonus points. Um, and you can support the show over on our website, anchor.fm backslash blasters tech and tech blades with a reoccurring subscription model, much like Patreon. Or you could do a one-time donation or reoccurring over at buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Again, buymeacoffee.com backslash author J.R. Hanley. Be sure to put in the comment section that it's for the podcast, and I will keep the lights on. I will keep Doc Seska and Nick Garber duly intoxicated. They will drink until their liver surrenders. Never surrendered. And she's out of uh, wine now, so her mommy juice is gone. So it's a perfect place to say, Doc, bring us home. Well, i have not. Oh, she's got more. <laughs> It's all about being prepared. Thank you for spending some of your precious time with us for the absentee, addle brain Nick Garber. Oh, sorry, addle brain JR Handley, too. 
Uh, I'm Seska. This was the Blasters and Blades podcast. We'll be back next week at the same time, same place. We're indulging our love of nerd culture, cheesy jokes, picking on JR, and hearing how wrong he is. Uh, no, you think it's the other way around, Doc, but I'm going to convince you of the error of your ways. Pineapple belongs on pizza. <laughs> <laughs>